Well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 519th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I'm excited to be your MC today for an ode to Willem de Kooning. We're thrilled to welcome special guests, John Elderfield, Joan Levy Hepburn, David Reed, Richard Schiff, Mark Stevens, Robert Storr, Charles Stuckey, Annalyn Swan, Flora Yukonovich, all hosted by Fong H. Bui and with an introduction by Amy Schichtel. We're honored to have Erica Hunt here who will conclude today's event with a poetry reading. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. Please check the chat for more information. And now to introduce today's lovely guests and hosts, uh, we'll just keep that for a sec. Now to introduce today's guests, uh, John Elderfield is Chief Curator Emeritus of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, where he organized De Kooning, a retrospective in 2011. Artist and musician Joan Levy Hepburn worked closely with Willem de Kooning until the end of his life. He was her personal mentor and guided her through art degrees at the Rhode Island School of Design and Kansas City Art Institute. Artist David Reed is the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Endowment for the Arts, John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, and Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. Richard Schiff is the Effie Marie Kane Regents Chair in art, at, in art at the University of Texas at Austin and directs the Center for the Study of Modernism. Mark Stevens is the former art critic of Newsweek, The New Republic, and New York Magazine. Together with Annalyn Swan, he is the author of De Kooning, An American Master, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 2005. Robert Storr is the former dean of Yale, sorry, apologies. Robert Storr is the former dean of Yale School of Art and senior curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Charles Stuckey has served as curator in major US museums, including the Art Institute of Chicago, where he organized highly acclaimed retrospectives for Paul Gauguin, Claude Monet, and others. Annalyn Swan is the former arts editor of Newsweek and an award-winning former music critic. She, with Mark Stevens, is co-author of the biography De Kooning, an American Master. Artist Flora Yukonovich completed her MA at the City and Guilds of London Art School in 2017. 2018, she completed the Great Women Artists Residency at Palazzo Monti in Brescia. Fong H. Bui is the publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail. And now it is my honor to hand the mic over to Amy Schichtel, the executive director of the Willem de Kooning Foundation. Over to you, Amy. Thank you. Good evening and welcome all. Thank you for joining us to celebrate Willem de Kooning's work and life on this 25th anniversary of his death on March 19th, 1997 at age 92. We have gathered, as Nick has expressed, a range of our esteemed friends to consider de Kooning's contributions and relevance, both for today and for coming generations. First, again, Fong and the Brooklyn Rail, thank you for making this event possible. I approached Fong about the rail helping to honor this special day specifically because the rail is a paper by, about, and for working artists and writers, a welcoming, welcoming open platform for multiple voices with no dogma or doctrine. And this, I really think, would have appealed to de Kooning's own values. It's similar in ways to the club, which de Kooning and his art circle founded in 1949 as a place to socialize and talk about art and ideas of all varied forms. So looking back and reflecting on the last 25 years begins with de Kooning passing away in 1997 as a major exhibition of his last decade of paintings was receiving accolades 
at its final venue, MoMA. A memorial was held at MoMA's garden. Larry Rivers played the sax. Friends like John McMahon and Leo Castelli reminisced and drinks were served. The obituaries expressed the palpable loss of de Kooning as the last abstract expressionist to leave us. An American master arriving as an immigrant from humble beginnings in Rotterdam as a pioneer, innovator, an adventurer. He was lauded for his willingness to change and in doing so make viewers relate to paintings in a whole new way, time and again. In 2001, the foundation was established in his honor to foster the study and appreciation of his life and work through research exhibitions and educational programs. The Pulitzer Prize winning biography was published in 2004. 2004 and five were replete with celebrations of the artist's centennial. MoMA's long awaited definitive retrospective took place in 2011 and occasioned the foundation a new, a new decade of research, public and children's programming, loans and collaborations such as toward the recent Soutine de Kooning exhibition. Now looking forward as always, our work will be guided by de Kooning's own practices, art, and values. We'll continue to work with and support our community and peers and continue to share his narrative, the creative complexities, beauty, and real intelligence to be found in his art and words. Today's not only, we all know this, uh, it's not only a day to reflect, but a day to really celebrate what's ahead as de Kooning's oft-quoted remark, you have to change to stay the same, takes on renewed relevance. Thank you all once again for joining us this afternoon, truly. I'd like to turn the discussion over to John Elderfield. John, uh, please welcome John. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, I was asked to um, reflect which I take to mean that I um, am not going to be doing heavy lifting and that the people who follow me will be doing the heavy lifting. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, uh, me and de Kooning. Um, I first became acquainted with de Kooning's work in the late 1960s. In fact, on my, precisely on my 24th birthday which was the day after de Kooning's 67th birthday. A friend from art school in New Yorkshire who had just returned from a fellowship in America gave me a work, gave me a copy of um, Tom Hesse's small monograph um, published in 1959 at a price of $1.50. Um, I had never seen a work by de Kooning there were none in England to see. So it was astonishing to me to see his development laid out in an ever-changing range of extraordinary paintings, albeit in pretty dismal reproductions, nearly all of them in black and white. I didn't know anything about de Kooning himself, but I learned from Hesse's book what his life had been like what struck me vividly was how de Kooning, when two years younger than I was then, had gone by boat from Holland to America. There, has said, he enjoyed the freer um, atmosphere compared to the more compressed environmental um, uh, aspects of the lowlands. Now, the atmosphere in England in the late 1960s was pretty free, but the environment was still compressed by class structure, and I fear to say by a lot of art that was timid, to say the least. So my friend said to me, why don't you apply for a fellowship to go to America? And I did. I knew I'd made the right decision when I finally saw de Kooning's paintings in his 1969 retrospective at the Tate. 
And it wasn't only the magnificent canvases themselves, finally seeing them in all their colour, but also the snide reviews by British critics complaining that de Kooning's work looked like the end of a tradition rather than anything new. Of course, we have now long known that de Kooning's originality was that he was at once new and traditional. Not one of those artists who, as Hess nightly, nicely put it in his book, goes through the ritual of stamping out his plot of ground, sticking a big flag in it and declaring independence. The cool reception of de Kooning's art in 1969 was certainly influenced by comparison of it with the plot of ground then occupied by conceptual art. Remember that? So I was pleased to get on a boat in 1970 and arrive in New York. And jumping far ahead, I was equally pleased when 40 years later, I got to have the great adventure of guiding the creation of a roughly 200 work retrospective of de Kooning's work at MoMA with a 500 page catalog, um, both opening in September of 2011. I say guided the creation because they could never have been done without the collaboration of Amy Schlichtel and her colleagues at the Willem de Kooning Foundation or of Lauren Mahoney and her colleagues at MoMA and of the many who had previously written about de Kooning, some of whom you will be hearing from this afternoon. Now, among the pleasures of being a curator is that you may choose, and if you are wise, will choose, to go and see many more works than can possibly fit into your exhibition. Then you refine your selections so that it will, even without explanatory texts, unfold a vivid account of your subject. The some 200 works of the MoMA show were winnowed down from almost twice that number. And the selection was made along with the model of the galleries in order to decide on which wall even each work would go. The aim was to provide in this reduced form a narrative experience that mirrored the constant dramatic changes of de Kooning's career. Another pleasure of being a curator is that you can visit your exhibition as often as you wish. I enjoyed walking through it with individual visitors to see if the narrative worked. It was therefore a particular pleasure to walk through the show with the single person who, after de Kooning's death, was the greatest exponent of developing by always changing, Bob Dylan. And that was what he immediately grasped and continued to wonder at as we walked slowly through the exhibition, saying in gallery after gallery, oh, look, he's changed again. And for me, the greatest moment came at the end. Bob had just said that the last paintings in the show looked like he had re repainted some of the earliest ones and made them better, a bit like remastering an old song. And then he asked if it, we could go back and look again at the Wall of the Woman paintings first exhibited in 1953. We did, and after standing for quite a while looking at it, he turned to me and said with a smile, well, I guess that's when de Kooning went electric. I know from Fong that his seeing woman one was life changing. So I shall stop here and find out, I hope, if Fong went electric as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words, John. 
Thank you. I mean, I'm 5'3 and 125 pounds. I can't do heavy lifting, John. But I just want to say that thank you for your wonderful words, Amy. Thank you for your love, the labor, and your dedicated board members and colleagues at the foundation all have been investing to keep Master Kunin's work relevant, alive, and accessible to all art lovers, really, from all walks of life, and especially young, aspiring artists. And we have one in our panel here, uh, Flora Junovic. Yes, she's tuning in from London. Yes, indeed. I, I'd like to thank John for sure, because his profound effort in creating that retrospective that I know none of us will get to see it like that in our lifetime. So it's tremendous. I'd like to thank our new friend and old friend for being part of the celebration, including Richard here, Richard Schiff, Robert Storr, both being essential consultant editors in the rail. Hooray. I think their, their brilliant and deep meditations on the Kunin pictorial complexities. I'd like to thank David Reed, you know, my old friend and new friend, John Hepburn for, for their remarkable insight on the Kunin specific, I would say painterly alchemy among all the hidden things. I thank Charles Stuckey who I just met a few weeks ago for the for his amazing insight on the Kunin's work as well. I'd like to thank Mark, and Annalyn for their eminently readable biography, uh, the winning biography, I should say, and a huge congratulation on their recent biography on Francis Bacon, Re Revelations. And of course, thank again, Flora, for being here, whose show at Victoria Miro is remain on view till next Saturday, March 26th. Yes, I, I like to, to begin by sharing to, with you all that I think haven't seen the retrospective as John, not many as many times John have, but at least 12 different times throughout its duration from September 2010 to January 2011. I remember thinking then as I do now of the Kunis life being like a book with different compelling chapters in a way, and the works embody in each chapter tell different compelling stories. And in thinking of how each of us have our own stories, I thought I'd share my own of how my life was changed by the Kunin in a few minutes. As John say, my encounter of woman one have changed my life forever. The longest story in due time will be shared in the greater depth when I pay a visit to the William de Kunin Foundation in the near future, but I'm skipping forward because we have many of our friends who would share their own insight and story about de Kunin's work. But basically when I enrolled at the New York Studio School, I, I basically came there with, on the premise to study painting with Mercedes Matter. And I remember very clearly it was on Saturday, four o'clock, I wrote down in my memo, that in my notebook, really, rather than memoir, is May 3rd, 1986. Uh, yeah, a friend of mine and I decided to go to Soho uh, so to see show. So as we were walking across the street to LaGuardia Place to the south corner of Houston Street, we spotted the Kunin with his typical white flap cap and white overalls walking with a young man. I discovered later that was his studio assistant, Tom Ferrara, to the same corner. We walked right up behind them as they were heading down to the corner of West Broadway and Prince Street. With my friend's encouragement, I got up all my courage and come up to the person who have changed my life. I walk up right to them and I say to the Kuhn, I say, are you Mr. De Kunin, sir? And he answered, yes, I am. I continue. Uh, I just want to tell you that your painting woman one have changed my life without skipping a beat, you know? He said with a smile, are you sure? I didn't even know I made the painting. <laughs> that was his answer. We laugh a bit and then we walk across the street together 
And then he asked me whether I would like to come to the opening reception of Elaine de Kunin show at Grumbaum Gallery. I still remember the show, the time of the bison. We stayed for a good hour. I remember how generous he was, he introduced me to all kinds of people, people there, including Michael Branson and others. And then we walk him back together with Tom to the parking garage, at which point he gave me his phone number and asked that I would visit him in the following weekend. Yes, I did. I, I, I visited him. My first visit lasted for a whole afternoon. Uh, it was amazing because he showed me everything in the studio, including the first painting that he made when he was 12 years old. It was so remarkable. And then he, he walked upstairs to show me where he slept, you know, and he pulled out a huge book of Norman Rockwell, artists and illustrators, because I told him I have studied to become commercial artist, you know? And he remembered that, so he pulled out the book and he said he respected and he had admiration for commercial artists. This similar, you know, this similar admiration is actually shared by a few friends, painter friends that we know, uh, including John Curran, Matt B. Levenstein, and Lisa Tuskevich. At any rate, I did manage to pay another visit and then spoke to him on the phone a bunch of times until Alzheimer's disease became more severe. You can correct me if I'm wrong, by the fall of 1987. I'm very eager, of course, to share a fuller story, but again, you know, that may be later, but I felt this is so nice, such an amazing opportunity for me to pay homage to, if you don't mind to call Master de Kunin, in a way, because I felt that his life and work encountered and meeting him have given me a, a amazing strength and stamina to mediate my own anxiety while living the bohemian life. I had dreamt of, of ever since in Vietnam growing up. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to share briefly with you all, as I told Amy this morning, is something my beloved grandmother once told me when I was 10 years old at the New Year's Day celebration. She say, when you grow up, grandson, you will suffer just like anyone's is in this earth. And don't ever think that your suffering is as more unique than theirs, but make sure that you suffer the right way. So that was very profound for me because I came later to realize that you know, everything about Mr. de Kunin, Master de Kunin, is exactly what, how he framed it or echo in his wisdom. As he said to himself, the desire to create a style beforehand is a mere apology of one's own anxiety. So I feel deeply grateful to him again for two things, at least for the time being. One, art or any form of cultural practice is not a horse race. Two, the ultimate profundity and deep joy in living life is the complete full embrace of the process of the journey in the present. As my friend, the art historian, James Lauren, told me just the other day, with chronic urgency, it's never at the point of arrival. So I'm grateful what I thought in doing, perhaps we can go through the slides, you know, in six chapters, uh, and then we can make comments. So maybe Nick, if you don't mind, we start the first set of images, which basically illustrate a little bit of the early figurations and abstraction leading to his first ornament show at Charles Egan Gallery, 1948, but this is it. This is the earliest that we know beside the one I described when he made when he was 12 years old. Basically, I felt it's so nice to understand the early work, partly because he was that product, very product. I remember talking to Rudy Buckhart, for example, uh, living in the law, uh, I think 6th and 7th Avenue and 21st Street. He was a good friend um, of the Kunin then. He was living with the dance critic and poet Edward Denby. 
um, I think around 1935, they were the earliest, um, the Kunin supporter. And I remember um, Rudy was once offered a lesson from the Kunin where he's just crumbled up a piece of paper by the window and asked Rudy to render it. <laughs> Can you imagine that was the case? So this is it. This, this is what we see here is a good example when the Kunin was trained in both commercial and the decorative art. What do we see in this early painting? 1916, so that made, what? 19, he was born 1904, so that's 12 years old more or less. Um, what do we see here uh, is a painting with a pitcher and a cup resting on a table there with a box, I think a matchbox on the bottom there. Yes, what do you think? Can we, can we, um, why don't we, Robert, can we start with you? I'm not sure I have much to say about this painting because it's not really, to my mind, a painting that is indicative of where he's going. So it is an important anchor for what he did later, but it is, it is a student painting or, or what amounts to a student painting. Right. I mean, it's interesting to see this sort of Matissean background with this otherwise very academic kind of still life thing, but it's it's not a clue to who de, de Kooning was or would become. Is that true, what Robert said there, John? Um, so de Kooning wasn't taking any painting classes at the time that he did this painting. This was done completely from observation of the objects and also observation of paintings. So uh, actually, when I first saw this painting, it had just been delivered to a studio about the week before by a family member. And uh, he wanted to show it to me because he hadn't seen it in a long time. And he was kind of embarrassed about the way, particularly the, uh, the handle on the cup hooks onto the cup because it's kind of from two different perspectives. And um, I, I understood that he felt kind of embarrassed about it because you know, as a painter, you always feel funny looking back at your very early work and all the mistakes because it takes a while to learn to see, but it's clearly a, a remarkable painting for a 12 year old. But um, he also showed me uh, the uh, still life painting drawings that he did at the academy that came after that and told me the whole process about learning to sculpt form and tone and uh, the painstaking classes that he went through at the academy. And um, in the retrospective show, one of those uh, Conte pencil um, drawings was hanging on the wall right next to this. Yeah, that's it. And so he, he did this quite a few years later than the, uh, the oil painting. And this actually came after exercises at the academy that started with things like uh, they were allowed to draw a square, a triangle and a circle. Mm -hmm. And they did this freehand with a very sharp, sharpened Conte charcoal pencil. And then after they mastered that, they would make a cube, a pyramid and a sphere. And he particularly talked about the sphere because they had to start from the inside and draw their way to the outer perimeter, sculpting the form and finding the outer edge and turning the paper around while they did this. And they, they did it by filling in the um, little textures in the paper. So, um, trying to, so it was a very painstaking, uh, exercise and he said that only he and one other student got through it at the academy everybody else kind of gave up on it right and so then when he did uh this still life he really had more of a command of sculpting form with tones and 
also very aware of edges, um, softness, sharpness, and uh, integration of all these forms and textures. And uh, he, he said, I look back at this drawing and I still say it's a darn good drawing, even in his later years. It certainly is. I was thrilled to see that. Richard, any, any observation you like to add in, in regard how this relate to the whole Dutch steel light tradition? Well, I would just, you know, I find it interesting that he picked up it just on his own. He picked up on, on a, a, a kind of divided brushstroke in that early um, still life so that you can't tell whether what's in the background. I'm not sure that it's whether it's wallpaper, which would be flat, or whether it's a tapestry, a rug hanging against the wall, or something over a piece of furniture that would be textured. Mm -hmm. So the, there are different textures represented, but, there, but the, what he's done is in a very modern way, sort of skipped over a lot of more elementary ways of seeing. And, um, and he's, he's painting like somebody in that decade, like, like a, a professional in that decade using a, um, a factor right. that mo most people would associate with Cezanne in those years, possibly well, with Matisse. Amazing. John, do you think there's a difference between how the drone is made as opposed to the painting we see here? Uh, I was just going to say to Richard that I wondered if this rug in the, the tapestry in the background was kind of inspired by some of Vermeer's paintings. I see. Um, but could be. Could be. John, are you there, John? Any? Yes, uh, Where are you, John? Yeah, here you are. Well, certainly what I think of is, you know, the relationship from this all the way to the very late paintings. Um, you know, that, um, you know, I mean, we know, for example, how um, he and Clement Greenberg ended up with it falling out a great deal. But one thing that Greenberg got very early on was de Kooning's determination to use you know, flat decorative elements, but also imbue them with volume. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to see him before he sort of entered modernism before somehow instinctively, this is something which he's interested in. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was really amused to hear um, that he himself was embarrassed by how he'd attached the um, uh, handle to the cup which obviously he hadn't figured out quite how to, to do that. But anyway, the painting carries it and it carries this whole impulse to have these two things going together. The, the more finished academic drawing from 21. I mean, it's an amazing, you know, amazingly proficient um, yeah. uh, performance. And, um, you know, as um, Richard and others have written, you know, the issue which de Kooning would face time and time again was he could be such a facile um, um, draftsman and he had to actually find some ways of um, impeding that kind of facility in order to find freedom to do other kind of things. Um, actually, Fong, I would like to take up uh, and comment, um, add to, to John's comment. Can we go back to the academic drawing for a second? Sure. Um, this one, yes, because uh, later in his life, de Kooning, um, you know, just loved to go against the classical tradition because he so clearly could. And once upon a time, he said a marvelous quote, he said, sort of gesturing at his painting, classical training is what freed me to do this which is a marvelous thought. Yes, it's so true, Adeline, and, and thank you, John, uh, and Richard, of all your insight there, because this was the condition that we might relate to Cezanne, because Cezanne have his own anxiety with the same predicament, desire to flatten out what he was painting, but also have a, a, a commitment to, to classical form. 
uh, of the old master. So hopefully we can go to the to the next images right here. So this is interesting. Uh, this is when he have encountered Matisse retrospective at the Lucensin Gallery in 1927. This is when he made this painting the same time, pretty much a year right after his arrival to New York. So this still life here um, is, is that interest openness in a way, because I don't know how to describe it, except that it had everything that he was seeing at the time with the just not just Miro or Matisse, but there's also there's neoplasticism, surrealism even. This is the time when he beginning to meet Gorky just two years later. So I don't know how to describe this painting in a way because it's have everything in it. You know, look and, and I remember reading John's description and somehow Richard have touched upon this too and others. So let's go to surprising someone else's in here. Let's, let's ask Charles Stuckey. Where are you, Charlie? It seems to me that there's a, a lot of personality in, in this painting already, a lot of, a lot of humor, a lot of uh, things, you know, counter to expectations. I mean, the idea of, of the still life remains, but instead of it being, you know, a, a sort of a predictable uh, putting, you know, vessels of different shapes together. I mean, he, here we have a bunch of eggs. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so casual and unexpected, it seems to me, in the tradition of, of still life. And then, you, you, you know, the way he, he takes that as a, a primary thing to look at, this, um, you know, sort of herd of, of, uh, of white eggs and, and runs it through the floor and the railing overlooking the, I, I guess, I mean, there's a sort of shadowy nocturnal aspect to it all that seems, I don't, there's something otherworldly, don't you think about the, the these glowing white eggs in this uh, sort of somber, uh, somber setting. I, 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 I just find the humor of it um, mm -hmm. very touching. Yeah. Yes, so true. Mark, what do you think about the echoing of the, the, the oval form on the floor below? Does that echo the X be, you know, on the table? What about the knife floating below the table too? I'm so perplexed by this painting. Well, I, I, think, I think you need to remember when you're looking at de Kooning's early art that he's, he's experimenting. He's a young person, he's a young artist. He's trying different styles. He's, uh, he's challenging himself in different ways. And so this painting doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily mean a great deal for his later work. But I find, I agree that it's a comical painting in a way, especially he's making fun of himself a little bit because mm -hmm. in the academy, as Joan was saying, uh, there was a great emphasis on learning how to draw a sphere properly, mm -hmm. even how to draw uh, circles um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a liner brush, things like mm -hmm. that. So here with these eggs, uh, which kind of comically nestle up to each other, you see, they're, 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 they're very not academically drawn. Yeah. And the rhyme, the rhyme uh, on the floor uh, is also sort of comical, isn't it? Because he would have known about grids by then and uh, Cubist thinking by then. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of Matisse challenging Cubism a little bit in the picture. But I think really it's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual painting in which he's trying lots of different things. And um, you know, he, he, it's more interesting really to talk about perhaps his later work, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> David, oh, here's John. John. Uh, you know, just to follow what Mark said, you know, we have to remember that de Kooning um, had a great sense of humor. Oh, yeah. You know, and there are things about this. I mean, you know, I looked at it a lot when it was in the retrospective, and I could never really sort of think of, and at one point I had this thought that it's a bit like um, Matisse and de Carico have gone to bed together. <laughs> and that's what they get. <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know, that he's, he's willing to look at very disparate sort of things and see, okay, if I did this, if I did a, 
you know, the, the, you know, the curricula like space, but did it and Matisse in colors, what it would it be like, and just carrying it through. And, you know, and there's really nothing quite like it, but it happens again. So he learns he can discard things as well as accumulate. It's so true. Uh, I, I talked to Jack, our friend Jack Flan the other day, how um, the, that very the vertical line that go through the, the bucket there is so reminiscent of that very same line that go touch near the, the young boy sitting in piano lesson, you know? And it's uh, clearly he was looking at that painting very clear, I mean, very, I would say carefully. Uh, so yes, the president of Matisse is there for sure. Let's go, if we don't, if you don't mind, Nick, let's go to the, the smaller study for beginning of his grand synthesis, so to speak, of small scale. The, the study for Williamsburg project here. Uh, and the next one is untitled, we'll get to a minute. So this is a very remarkable period. Uh, this is right into the, the middle of WPA during the Great Depression. This is the time when he really decided to paint full time. Uh, remarkable to think about that period. So I'd like to see whether, um, let's say, David, are you here? Do, what do you see here, David? In this one, and I like even more the painting of the couch. Yeah. I think you have an image of that as well. Yeah. That's the one that haunts me, the couch, because it's so much about de Kooning. It's, it's very sexy, very funny, mm -hmm. strange color, both abstract and figurative. Mm -hmm. This one, just as long as it's here, uh, is reminiscent not only of Gorky, who de Kooning was very close to at this time, but also of the work of Ilya Bolotovsky and other people who were working in this particular idiom in this particular time. So it's this is like it's got a flair to it that most of them don't have. But it's 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 an attempt to reconcile cubism with surrealism with biomorphic forms and geometric forms and to layer them. But for de Kooning, who was Dutch after all, to play with these things in this way was also to play with with Mondrian, who was in the background and who was very severe by comparison. So true. Yes, indeed. Flora, do you have any comment on this early work at all. Where are you, Flora? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I just, I think it's interesting how like poised all the elements are and they feel like they're just about to animate or they're just perfectly balanced. And it's like, for me, that sense of movement and animation is so much part of de Kooning's work and you can see it already being like a central concern. Um, and it's interesting to see it explored in such a flat way and to think about how that goes on to be explored in like the process of painting and with the meatiness of paint. I really love these works. Yes, Richard, maybe last comment before. Well, we some, yeah, some Stuart Davis in these paintings, I've always thought. And also, I mean, this is the time of um, de Kooning doing, you know, through the 30s and 40s, doing commercial work, using commercial techniques and the the hard edge is is related to that, um, and the I mean the small format. It's the it's a format for producing a, a design that would be printed in a magazine, um, and and he was thoroughly familiar with those those techniques and continued yeah. to use them the rest of his life. Really, blowing it up into much larger scale. It's so true. I, I love the implicit instability of that line. Uh, the seesaw line in the center. You feel that although this is a, a work that he's trying to make structured and cohesive in a compositional way, it could all collapse in a moment if just that line tipped over. The, yeah. uh, it would seesaw, it would upset. And I think you, that's an implication of de Kooning, of the, of de Kooning who's coming. Yeah. And also the beginning of, you know, sort of infusing abstraction and figuration together. We only see hints of it. Just, I always felt the left image with the red, um, 
I see that as an arm <laughs> holding up on the top, you know, sort of with the quite kind of cryptic torso in the black form there. But I do see two figure in conversation in some way. Uh, Nick, can we go to the next image, the untitled piece, 1937 here? That's even more so. So where do you, you mentioned about Gorky Robert? Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that relationship briefly? Well, Gorky was ahead of de Kooning um, by, I don't know, months or years, but not, not, not very much. And there's a famous exchange of letters where somebody uh, has written that uh, Gorky was influenced by de Kooning and de Kooning objects and writes a letter to the editor said, no, 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 I come out of Gorky. I come out of that uh, sort of the blinding uh, vitality of my visits to his studio at this time. And I think that all of them are assimilating things that they've seen in European painting uh, of the same period. And all of them are doing things that are, in a sense, uh, necessary for what they did later. But what's necessary for each one of them is different. Here you can see curves that will recur again and again and again. The sort of purple buttocks curve the uh, in the last one, that black shape. These are things that d become de Kooning's basic uh, dynamic vocabulary, and he just gets this uh, curve into his hand and into his arm at such a point that it also just generates itself in the process of making. So this is this is a beautiful gem of a study for what is essentially the the, the basic, what he called culture, meaning yogurt, of his art thereafter. So de Kooning told me a very detailed story about meeting Gorky for the first time. And uh, he had gone to a party downtown with a bunch of other artists. And, he, and everybody was saying, oh, that's Gorky, the master. And uh, Gorky was not that much older than de Kooning. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some discrepancy about what year he was born. But de Kooning was April 24th, and Gorky was April 22nd. And so and it could have been that he was born two years before or maybe not. So they were very close in age, but de Kooning always very close in age, but I'm getting a, a echo. You're clear now, you're clear. Um, so, but de Kooning always referred to him as his master. So what happened was uh, the day after the party, He's, he's walking down, they're both walking down the street and they bump into each other and they say, oh, you're the guy that was at the party. And he said to Kooning, do you want to come to my studio? And de Kooning said that he kind of looked like, are you, are you talking to me? Because, you know, who am I? And you're the great Gorky. So he went to the studio and he walked in and he saw Cezanne's and Matisse's and, you know, all these Poussin, all these great works of art. And he said, boy, you have one hell of an art collection. And he said, I painted all of these paintings. And he said, you did. If you could paint like that, why don't you just paint your own paintings? And he said, because I have to learn my craft before I can speak my own voice. So then de Kooning invited Gorky to his studio. And at that time, Gorky, uh, de Kooning was making those early paintings like, you know, with the uh, circus elements and things like that. He was, his girlfriend was an acrobat. So there was this one painting of a uh, uh, circus trainer holding a, a hula hoop and there's a bird and uh, and Gorky says, that bird is gonna fly right through that hoop. And de Kooning said that it pleased him so much because that was his intention. And he was glad that Gorky grabbed that. And so then he really started uh, learning from Gorky, learning a lot of things from Gorky. And back to the eggs, there was a, a Neoplatonist element to using the symbols of eggs and paintings at that time. Gorky, de Kooning, and other artists were having a Neoplatonist aspect to their paintings. So um, Gorky then would 
say you need to flatten your forms, but also allow them to still have volume and space in the painting. And, uh, and he started telling him techniques about how to uh, work with edges and sand down surfaces and build up luminosity of paint density. And um, when they started doing the figure paintings, uh, de Kooning didn't like to work with models because you have somebody in the room and they distract you and you know, you're worried about making them do it for a long time. So he made his own mannequins by putting on a pair of pants and getting into a vat of glue and then getting into a position. And so the pants became sculptures. So the folds would be very rigid sculpted forms that you see in a lot of those Gorky paintings like the portrait of Gorky and his mother. And, uh, and then de Kooning started doing that with his paintings as well. So you get these beautiful sculpted refined forms. Yeah, we'll bring, let's connect. We move to the next images, Nick, because this is it. This is exactly what you were describing, Joan. What, what strike me so um, remarkably so when I saw this painting and learning about how and what was shared between Gorky and de Kooning where every weekend almost they would visit the Met and look at the Bosco Treze mural, those wonderful Romanesque mural, um, fresco rather, and the quality of that tonality, I think, what you described earlier also, Richard, um, is that the, the, the way that it's painted with how I remember reading one instant that he was so impressed when he first visited Gorky's studio in Union Square where everything's impeccable and how um, Gorky would use razor blade to scrape up access of paint in order to create that incredible porcelain like smooth surface. Um, but at the same time, where does that fit into the Great Depression? This is the time when he already decided to become a full-time painter. John, can you make a remark on this very instant? Well, looking at the glazier, um, you know, I think is you know a particular reminder of you know just how adept a painter he has become, and. Um, um, you know, I think it's a, an amazing work. However, it does have a slight quality of him showing off, mm -hmm. you know, of um, a kind of display of his um, brilliance. Um, and it's something which I think he, um, you know, he can do so well and that he will eventually just pull away from it a little bit because I think it can be and I think he understood that down that road lay a kind of ingratiating painting. I mean, you know, this thing is so beautiful and so marvelous that, um, you know, you, you feel that, um, you know, where can he go from there? And of course, you know, he tells us where he's going to go from there. He's going to go and do something very different um, to this. Yeah, Richard, what about the the what is he looking at besides fresco? You know, those Roman beautiful fresco that we mentioned in the Met there. What, what a, how did it relate to Picasso, for example? Well, well, I, you know, I, I would say maybe Ankh more than Picasso in some of these pictures. Yeah. Um, with uh, the, um, the anatomy, uh, uh, gets converted into a kind of idealized uh, form that isn't anatomically correct. Mm -hmm. But I also, uh, you know, in these paintings also uh, have always been impressed by his, uh, it's very evident by this time, his interest in working from the outside in mm -hmm. so that a form can be defined by painting around it. Um, and he gets these very tense edges so it looks linear, but in a way it's really produced by being very precise 
with the brush, with the paint. Right. Also, this painting shows some of his marbleization uh, work that he learned how to do um, when he worked for the industrial design place in Holland. Yeah, it's true. Can we, can we go to the next one, Nikki? Just similar period also. This is, the, this is what you were referring to, Richard. I mean, he knew how to draw and certainly thinking of Aang, you absolutely right, like the way Picasso was thinking of Aang also. Mm. Uh, but there's some discrepancy, the way that he, you know, began to, to somehow place the certain part of the anatomy deliberately wrong. I don't think that he, he was doing it um, unconsciously. What do you think about that, John? You think, you think that's fairly accurate that the tendency to somehow create tension in different part of the ana anatomy? Well, I think in, um, in drawings like this, um, um, you know, I, I think that he is doing um, in a very different style what, as we know, Cezanne would do, where you would go back and you would work those contours and sometimes you would lose them, sometimes you would reinforce them. Um, and I think that, you know, he's starting with the um, figural subject and then going back and I mean, like the way in which he um, um, gives that sort of reciprocation between the raised and the lower um, shoulder and then the, um, the arc which he finds in the biceps. And you can see is um, um, creating um, effectively a kind of conversation through different parts of the painting in a way one part speaks to another part which speaks to another part which does so um, you know in the one sense to create the whole and another way to um, pull it away from the whole and I think you know to, to see him doing it in drawing and then you know, we will see him doing it uh, more directly in painting within a very short time. It's true. Nick, can you, can you focus in where the elbow meet the upper left pelvis? Just fo focus in a little bit. We can see here this area right here. Yes. So that's what you talk about, John. Yes, I'm looking at the, well, yeah, yeah. bring it down a little bit. Yeah. I mean, sorry, you can see a little higher. Can we look at the image a bit higher? And then one can see, you know, what he's doing. I mean, with the show, the top of the shoulder where he's putting that, the, all those little reinforcing marks on it. And then he's jumping over and doing something mm. on the other side and moving it down here. Yeah. Um, and um, some of them are, I mean, they're, they're never quite escape being representational, but they also, in a way, do. I mean, what, you know, there's no obvious reference to the, the top of the marks there. It's not as if the man's got a hairy neck or anything. You know, we're not supposed to think that. It's yeah. the, 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 the presence of the making is just, you know, in view right through the work. Yeah, we begin to see the content of the glimpse more clearly. <laughs> uh, Ron, can, can I uh, follow up there, there too? Uh, because yeah. this is this is an absolutely fascinating moment uh, because uh, de Kooning is, is sort of betwixt the, the classical again and what he was attempting to break out of. And so could we go to the next uh, image very quickly? So here, obviously we have something of a sort of classical rendition of the body, sort of muscular jar. And, but then the paintings that come out of that are very, very different. And at that particular moment in time, this sort of disconnect between his obvious academic ability to do a anatomical drawing and then what you see as the classic male, which is, you know, all the, the planes all over the place, uh, the image doesn't come together. So there was a, a marvelous quote uh, from that period by Edward Denby, uh, who Fong, I know that you met as well. 
and um, uh, and sorry, Rudy Burkhart uh, and and Edwin Denby was his housemate. And Edwin Denby said um, the essential paradox of de Kooning's work in the late '30s was how sophisticated his understanding was of every style and artistic idea but how his working idea at the time was to master the plainest problems of painting. I often heard him say that he was beating his brains out about connecting a figure and a background. So isn't that fascinating? Because, you know, I would submit that this, fig that this painting is all about, you know, the figure and the background and trying to make them work together. And I would love to hear what other people have to say. I think you're right, Annalyn, and I think that's, the process that John was referring to earlier on about where the construction and destruction of the classical figure painting is happening simultaneously and that became uh, his subject in a way for the whole of this period and and uh, it's it's important to note that there are other references to Walt Kuhn is an artist that nobody talks about anymore but there's mm -hmm. Walt Kuhn in this as well so that de Kooning the Dutchman in New York was picking up New York American references, even as he was grappling with French, Spanish, i.e. Picasso, Angresque uh, stylistics. And the, 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 the hybridity of his mix was really uh, important and uh, one of the reasons that it kept churning. Can I add something here, which yeah. is that um, uh, yeah. what fascinates me is the way line is uh, unable increasingly to hold the figure so that he is he's struggling with the idea of how does he make a figure painting given his classical understanding of the figure um, he doesn't feel it's true that line should be able to hold the figure and you can see it beginning to melt away and have its own life in this picture uh, lines be uh, relate to the body but they're also not containing the body or contained by the body Yes, and this is the period that um, began using... There's a, a kind of float happening. Right. There's also, like, the difference between, like, a Michelangelo figure drawing and a Raphael drawing. Yeah. So yeah. Michelangelo draws like a sculptor. He draws a very closed form. He's thinking about the body as a closed form. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. Raphael thinks about the air and the space around the form. And de Kooning would be more in that school than in the closed form. And when you can start moving through space around the body, then you can start integrating the figure in the ground. Yes, I, I'd like to ask, um, here, here's John. John. Um, I mean, just to, to um, add what was just said, I mean, you know, I think this is an amazing painting for him thinking you know, I mean, the, the, you know, the traditional problem of figure painting is um, how do you paint what you can't see? How do you paint the back of the figure? Yeah. How do you give a sense of the space moving around it? And so he sort of delaminates the figure in a way, you know, and that there's a sort of ghost of the back hanging out within the ground, but is it within the ground or on the ground? And you can't quite see how it is. Um, the other name, which I don't think we have the time to go into this, of course, is John Graham. Yes. You know, and this is, a, you know, the, the stylization of the head and everything is very much a sort of John Graham thing. But the, the way in which it's realized and also, and particularly that amazing lower part of it is, um, you know, you, you know by now that you're in the, you know, that you're looking at the work of a really great artist. Yeah, I'd like to, to make just a, a brief comment just in regard to John Graham, you just say John, and uh, you mentioned what Kuhn, Robert. Um, so that all fit in very interestingly as a kind of potential synthesis of that period the impoverty of the Great Depression. Kuhn, Walt Kuhn had painted a lot of performer clouds, just, just like the way that Picasso identified with the marginal circus performer and whatnot. But also a, a mystical quality because Graham uh, was, have claimed to have known, you know, Rasputin and was very interested in Gurdjieff and theosophy. 
So there's that element, but we won't have time to go into it because right now it's been an hour and seven minutes. So we got to move on here a little bit here. Yes, Seated Woman, 1940. Indeed, one of the first series of women. Um, I think probably two years after he met Elaine Free, who later he's married, 1943. So my question is this. Uh, how would we describe the paint surface here? It's somewhat retained, very similar to the previous man painting, but the color have changed significantly. Uh, why don't we ask a few painters here too? Let's say, David Reed. David, where are you? I'm right here, Fong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you now, you unmute yourself. You mute yourself. Let's do unmute again. Do unmute, okay. Great. Well, this is a strange painting. I um, love the red and the green outlines, you know, separating the outlines out in that way on a flat, but having it suggest the forms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. Uh, but how would, uh, Okay, how do we um, describe the variety of using line? Okay, you you absolutely write about the green bow line that sort of go around her cross leg in the bottom, you know, as opposed to that very thin painted red um, around the leg. But and then I didn't forget to I forgot to mention the use of charcoal is so unorthodox. Who would do that, Richard? Come on. Yeah. Um, well, that's, you know, it's part of his commercial designing with where you put in the form, you erase it, but you keep a trace of it. Right. Uh, when you paint over and then you can retrieve it if you want. I, I'd also, with regard to this painting, but especially others of, of this time period and especially in the drawings in the 40s, or, or maybe, you know, two or three years later. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, John mentioned the, uh, you know, the problem of representing what you don't see around a volumetric form. And that issue becomes present at the contour because the, uh, an observer like tuning, I think you or anybody observing a contour closely is never certain where the end of the turning form really is. So you keep adjusting the contour to get a little more, mm -hmm. and then maybe it goes too far. And so you come back again, but Cezanne did that, Picasso did that, de Kooning does it like crazy mm -hmm. in some of the drawings where it, it seems like he's just doing the contour over and over and over again. And if he doesn't in the paintings that it tends to get erased by paint, but in the drawings, it, nothing gets erased, or sometimes it does with gouache. But you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But there, there is that struggle to understand how much you can actually see when you observe a form that you know has a backside to it. You know it's a volume in, in space being affected by light. Right. Uh, we should also find, note that this is the entrance of de Kooning's great subject, woman. And, you know, it, just to do a compare and contrast between this painting and what we just saw in the men, because the men are very, uh, uh, you know, not coming together to any degree at all, as, as we've just, you know, talked about. Whereas if you go back to this one, the uh, seated woman, if, if we could just return to that. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, whatever else is going on here with playing with the, you know, figure and ground, this is a woman, you know, we now have a, a sort of tactile image, a tactile presence, which is going to inspire de Kooning really for the rest of his life. Yeah. In particular, the use of curves and reverse curves, because if you take the lower part of this painting, and even the arms and the upper torso, it's a code for the things that he did when he was very, very old. And he, he, he was able to revise 
uh, an inside-outside dynamic, that is to say, opposite sides of the same limb, and where the pressures were and where the line tapered and so on, he was able to revise that infinitely and come up with fresh things for the rest of his life. This is really the crux of how there was a late de Kooning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Flora, you've been, you know, invested in painting women, particularly your recent work in regard to Venus. How do you read this particular representation of woman as an image and how it's painted? Well, I think that there's something interesting about how thick and decisive the lines are around the bottom. Like she's really sitting there and she has weight and volume. She's not kind of an ideal. She's, I think, got like heft to her body. But then there's also the use of the charcoal and things, I think suggests, um, the idea that she's sort of moving and in flux at the same time and um, sort of her upper body seems much lighter. Um, but I also think like the move to these jewel like colors that seem to be kind of lovingly rubbed off and there are sort of other, other layers showing through. It's quite, um, it's quite a romantic view of, of the sitter, I think. It's quite, he's sort of lavished a lot of attention on the face and the, and the skin tones. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you see anything uh, at all in terms of the, of the ambivalent of spatial, um, I would say, anchoring? Is it indoor, outdoor combined, or, or what other way can we see it? Yeah. You know, <clears throat> when, when Rob, Rob pointed out the, the, the striking similarity between the outlines in her lap. And, and and sort of the, the the general gestalt of his late paintings, which which really you you know it is hard is hard to ignore, but it, but it seems to me at the same time that 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 those outlines and and the way he treats the folded legs on, on the figure is is related Fong to what you to the story you said about Burkhart asking him you know how should I learn you know, to, to to work as a as a painter, and he crumples up a piece of paper and puts it on the windowsill and says, you know, draw the crumple. There's um, you, you know, th th this becomes a kind of a, a major motif of his this 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 crumpling mm -hmm. rather oh. than 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 flatness. Um, the the you know the. The, the 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 flux of form the um the conundrum of 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 form folding in around itself around the body i i, I that yeah that's a very good point yeah. i think the, the other thing about the crumpled paper yeah. is that you have to look at it because it's not a nameable object that has a specific mm. you know it's not a chair or a cup you know you have to look at it to be able to draw the crumples. Mm -hmm. And Kooning was all about looking at things really carefully. Yeah, it's so, it's so intense to think about that now because Rudy, of course, regretted it, <laughs> that he never you know, took the lesson and had the patience to go through it, the whole um, you know, proposed you know, class, really. Uh, but I know that he did manage to say that he did look at it and realizing the crumble paper beginning to enlarge itself slowly, you know, so it's a, a, a live form. But anyway, let's go to some more count because can, we have to give. Can, well, can, can I just stop with that painting for one second? Sure, sure. I think people should rem look at And by the way, Rudy had other fish to fry, so that's not a problem that he didn't do that. But yes. in this particular painting, when anybody ever says that de Kooning was a misogynist or was cruel in Woman One or whatever it is that they say, look at this painting because this is the counter term to it. And de Kooning actually was not the, the monster that he is uh, portrayed as being for having painted a monster. Um, of course, there's the ambivalence of psychology of men and women, etc. But besides that, just the tenderness that he lavished on this portrait is the counter term to the anger and violence in the other. And I would like to add something to that too. I think that's a terrific point, Rob. Well, and you, and you can't take one without the other. In this painting, you begin to see de, de Kooning developing a very personal relationship with women. I mean, on, on the one hand, yes, she still retains some classical 
characteristics. It's as if she's, she, she, part of her wants to be an angresque woman, mm -hmm. but yet you can feel his hands all over her. You can begin to feel uh, the, the colors and the, the intensity beginning to move into the figure. And that is de Kooning in relation to the female figure. Um, and it becomes just more and more and more. I mean, she's sort of, uh, it, it's, it's a portrait, not just of a woman, but of a paint, of a, but of a man painting a woman. Yep, it's and so true. Cool. Can I just inject that, that yeah. late yeah. in his life, de Kooning had nurses looking after him. And when Gary Girls and I were working on the show of late de Kooning's, we talked to them. And one of them said uh, that he came to her late, very late in his life and simply cupped her head in his hands and said, you're so beautiful. And I think that is the, the, the emotional factor that is behind this picture, too. So, you, you know, to everybody's point about that, you know, that the, the first woman that we were just looking at. And then if you look at this sort of first series of women and and pink angels and to everybody's point about de Kooning's uh, anything said about his misogyny is kind of you can't look at the exuberance of this painting, which is uh, remarkable both to me, at least, both for the the kind of uh, the, the sort of love of the female form that's involved here, but also the, the other part of de Kooning that's now suddenly coming to the fore, which is that incredible velocity of his line. You know, the other painter said that he had a, a line that went like a million miles an hour, that whiplash line, but... Um, um, the, his first wonderful example of the whiplash line coming into play is also in a painting about women's figures, uh, you know, the female form, which to me is just makes this painting so remarkable. I mean, what was just being said about de, Ke de Kooning's relations with women reminded me of something that um, John Elderfield, you and I saw in your Scholars Day at the de Kooning show. Do you remember Linda Nochlin? I remember and Linda Nochlin, yes. She came and she talked about Woman One. And she said, when I first saw this painting, I thought it was um, misogynist and violent and I hated it. And then she did a little dance going in a circle and came around and faced us again and said, now I want to be just like her. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's really true of de Kooning. You can really tell how much he loves women. And it's very moving to see. Yes, John? Yes. Um, yeah, I remember this very clearly. And I think that um, after doing the dance and that, she actually said, I want to be woman one. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, just like her. I want to be just like her. Yeah. Yeah. She was, and she was ferocious. You know, I mean, this is we jumping ahead, but it's interesting when you um, um, read some of the um, uh, critical responses to that 1953 show. Now it they just seem sort of visible. I mean, how could anybody? Um, be so literal as to think that a, a, a loosely painted picture like that was misogynist. And, um, um, and I think they, the best review of it was from um, all our friends, um, Leo Steinberg, who said that, um, you know, if you don't find this, um, these women very beautiful, um, um, you should go and look at the whole history of painting women and some of the most tender paintings you'll ever find will be of people who are not actually hugely wonderful. And that, um, you know, it's the wrong way to look at paintings to be, there we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's amazing, John. Yeah. I, 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 I regretted the, the I mean, I, I was very upset how woman four couldn't be land for your show from the Nelkin Atkin. But that's another story. The story of 1953 show the woman at Sydney Janus. It's unbelievable that none, none of those paintings was show uh, during the course of the show, except for woman one. And I told Amy not long ago, 
Mai Shapiro make a phone call to Alfred Barr and encourage him to get this painting for the museum. Oh. And he did. You know, but that was a week after the show was closed. So it's remarkable, all this amazing work that is, I mean, almost got the whole painting, the whole series there at your retrospective, John. Um, well, so I'm, I think it would be unseemly for me to um, complain still about um, that work not being learned. But um, <laughs> um, on a We'll let it go. We'll let it go. Note about um, uh, relationship with women since we're on this. Um, when Alfred Barr took um, Blanchett Rockefeller to see the exhibition, uh, Murmur had committed to buy this, and he suggested that she might want to buy another one. Mm. So um, um, she went with Alfred to see the show. And de Kooning knew they were coming and he put on his suit and was all very snappily dressed. And um, as we know, he was, you know, very good looking. And um, so she, she said to him, I think she was very impressed by him and shook his hand and said, um, I really loved, I'm glad to meet you and I'm looking forward to being able to earn your picture. And he said, oh, Mrs. Rockefeller, you look like a million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> for, what it's, for what it's worth, at the time that de Kooning was making these, Elaine was making drawings of him naked. And there's a whole sketchbook of these drawings. And it's interesting to see her tender and erotic regard for him mirrored in these pictures, I think. Because, <laughs> frankly, I think this is not a hostile picture. Yes. I think, uh, could, could I cut in a little bit? I, I think what's interesting is that he he loves and is angry and all those things all at once. I mean, the uh, it's not that he's he just loves women. Uh, mm -hmm. It's much more complicated than that. He loves and much more. And he wrestles those contrary feelings into pictures at the same time very often. And that's what makes them uh, they, so subtle and so, uh, you know, uh, so rich in, in, in really in humanity because they're complex. They're really, his relationship to women is complicated and there's no reason to, that anyone should be embarrassed about that or ashamed of it. Uh, that, I mean, we all have complex relationships with other people. Why shouldn't that be on the, on the canvas? Um, so it's true. I can see that Anlin wants to interrupt me, so. No, 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 no. I just want to reinforce what you're saying because um, remember, uh, we quoted in the book that uh, uh, somebody said, oh, she's so fearsome and, and, and ferocious. And uh, de Kooning said, well, have you ever seen women at Klein's department store uh, looking at a bargain table? <laughs> so, but it wasn't, he, he could hold those two uh, opposites in his mind, obviously at the same time. Uh, he, I remember another uh, wonderful anecdote where he said of one of his, uh, Juliet, one of his early um, women, um, and somebody said, oh, she, you know, she's so charming. And de Kooning snapped and said, uh, uh, she uses that charm. So, you know, he, the dichotomy was always there, but I, I would, I would agree with everybody else that, that, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a misogynist by any means, you know, he, he was more of, of a realist. What are people like? Elaine, Elaine, I mean, Elaine, Go ahead. E Elaine her, herself uh, said, if, if, that, if that picture is hostile, it's not me. It's not a reference to me, she said. It's a reference to his mother. Well, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but don't we think really that the hostility is, is, is towards his own frustrations with making the painting? I yeah. mean, it seems to me that the paint, that, you know, the, to read the frustrations uh, that are so evident in in the the language of marks and the starts and the stops and the distractions and so on and so forth. I mean, it seems to me that it's much more about him and his activist painting than it is about his attitude to women in general or one particular woman. I mean, it's the 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 image is a woman, but the the painting is about painting. It seems to me. 
Right. Yeah, he did. He also he, thought they were funny. You know, he thought he thought this yeah. was a funny picture. There was humor in this picture yeah. as well as everything else. Yeah, it's a com comment on the old American oh, had girl. That. Yes, I uh, okay. So we can stay on this <laughs> painting for the next three hours, literally. But I just want to add one comment, quick comment that what sh shocked me about this painting also every time that I look at it, but the last time was as John retrospective, when I realized that, you know, the centralization of her moving to the left, he had to paint it that aggressive metal paint on the right, that, you know, vertical that go down to pull her to the middle. And I just love that brush stroke that disrupt that line on the left there. It's just so incredibly intelligent. Okay, so can we go to Fire Island, um, which is talk about extensively in a way in Richard's book, the, this right here. Um, yes. What do we see here, Richard? <laughs> well, as, as Charlie said, we see painting. <laughs> is, you know, is is what we see, and um, I, I, you know, with thinking, uh, you know, here, so here, it's harder to, um, you know, discern exactly what it is, but there, there are things that you can pick up on. Um, with all of the women, I mean, you know, he sometimes said, well, you know, I have to paint something, and I like women. So I paint women, but basically he's making paintings and exploring pictorialism without becoming, um, in some periods he becomes an abstract artist, I guess, but usually not. And usually the, the form is derived from observing things and those things can be inanimate objects and they can be figures in motion. Probably more, he was more interested in the human body and its different perspectives than in objects, but they both get in there. Yeah, true. Flora, are you there? I'd like to ask you a little bit whether you see that incredible titanic Baroque or Rococo energy in terms of display or representation of curvy linear form, asymmetry and whatnot. Where are you? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I think it's interesting to see the forms that I can't remember who said it, but someone said that he'd started this kind of language for himself in those early paintings. And you see them kind of coming out really easily here. Um, and yeah, there's just something about the way they, um, the way the space in between is kind of squeezed to become these interesting kind of tendrils of shapes. It's, um, it's got amazing kind of momentum through it that feels kind of Rococo, yeah. Right. Right. Nikki, let's go to the next images. I believe we have a study. Here it is, Judgment Day, the study for backdrop for Labyrinth. This is what I want to ask you. I think if it's nice if we can make a quick comment about it because one of the things that really strike me about the Kunin, occasionally he would create a study and then he would make a painting just like it. You know, it just like an old master would do. You, you worked up to a drawing to sketch to the final drawing and you blow it up. So well, that, how does that- That was also, also the backdrop for a ballet, so it had to be- Right, right, exactly. But, but no one done that, I, as I remember, with one exception maybe that I, uh, maybe Mother Whale when he were commissioned that huge mural at the National Gallery, the Elegy. No, but Gorky did it with his portraits of himself and his mother. That's which true. Sometimes even scored. I mean, this is where the whole myth that uh, uh, was created by um, Harold Rosenberg about coming to the painting without anything in mind and mm -hmm. no design and so on and so forth simply falls apart. It was a wonderful piece of critical literature, but it no way reflects the process of the artists involved. And since uh, Rosenberg was writing about de Kooning probably more than Pollock, it's particularly apropos that this does does in fact, as Fong said, you know, become the, the, the design for something that was executed on a grander scale, strictly according to that design, or at least close to it. Um, and I think all of the rehearsals that he made uh, in these curves, these lines, these intervals 
are the, the key to what he was doing. He was restructuring classical art according to a new free-floating set of forms in space. Also, you know, what's incredible is he had to work so quickly on this. Um, I think it was, uh, gosh, I can't remember who what was the painter with. Oh, it was Milton Resnick. Um, yeah, they Milton had, Resnick. Resnick, right. And they had one day, I believe, David, it, 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 one yeah. day and a night to do this. And mm -hmm. the blow up process was 22 inches by 28 inches to 17 by 24 feet. And I, re I also remember uh, 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 Gorky did not know how to grid up like uh, de Kooning. And obviously de Kooning, this, this came from his decorating days, not even the academy when he was at Hitting and Sons in, you know, his, from 12 years old. Isn't that just astonishing? It's astonishing. Yes, we also, have a, a painting that I would love to show, but because of, we have to really make this reductive in, in, in images, but uh, Asheville, uh, one of the paintings that I adore so much at the mm. collection, about this same size, even smaller. It's it's ter terrific how so much energy in it and the scale as an art student, here it is, we have it. I mean, it's 25 and 31 inches. And this is the same way that I expect when I see it, it will be so titanic and monumental the way that we saw uh, Piero you know, um, you know the the famous uh, painting in Ubino, flagellation. You know, and when you go there, Richard John, um, it's tiny. <laughs> it's amazing. The scale is is so mysterious to me. I don't know how to describe it. Okay, so let's go next to self portrait in wilderness. Uh, this is where I really want Charlie to make some comment here. Um, if you can find it, it's the 1947 self-portrait in the wilderness. Can you make a comment on this painting, Charlie? You know, I, I, I look at it again. I remember seeing this for the first time at Andrew Crispo's gallery and, uh, and being so surprised that it was by a de Kooning. I mean, it, it um, you know, there, there, this would have been probably back in the early 1970s when, um, you know, the, the, the number of works that, that, that were by, by de Kooning that, that, that people would know about were, uh, you know, just a, just a handful. Mm -hmm. and, and, this seemed, and this seemed to be, you know, so, so explicit. Um, and, and, you know, with all the, everything we've learned you know, in, in the past 50 years. But for example, again and again, you hear that he has a, an image of Masaccio's Adam, Adam and Eve on, this, on the studio wall. I mean, that, that, um, that, that, it, that, that this seems to, to show him, you know, being haunted by the art of the past. Uh, as somehow a projection upon himself, I guess. But there's some, um, you know, it's it's um, it's it seems to me that it, it's got this that that off key color that we've noticed really since the beginning of our conversation this afternoon, and um, the 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 almost otherworldliness of of the of the setting that. Um, that that puts but that puts the figure whenever he he includes it or a part of it on, on edge to be in a space like that you know that's that's in a state of perpetual perceptual per, perpetual perceptual flux yeah okay any any comment uh, can be made in terms of reference to being in in being poor. <laughs> Being poor. Well, uh, at if, which, well, if it's if it's a reuse of a canvas, that's you know because it's. I mean, I read this as two different paintings on the same surface, not um, you know. So that that um, green and warm brown, it's not the background for that figure. Okay, I, I agree with Richard on that very much. I think. This was a, yeah. an abandoned painting 
on which he may have made a sort of half joke. I mean, it's a very sad picture, but he might have been in a bad mood or melancholy or said he makes this, uh, this figure in the middle of this out of sort of uh, in this in this background of a of a contemporary abstraction. It's a I think it's a kind of a, a comic, uh, sad, sad comic one off, really. OK, but it's fascinating. Why don't we go? Well, to... it's, a, it's a very surprising painting for him, but it's a very good painting. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the next, I think, two images we have here. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this painting. I'm so happy to see it in the show. Um, there's something incredibly strange about the two arms. And we know that he was so poor at the time that he would find mannequins, thrown away mannequins in, in the you know, garment district and brought a few of them home, put his own clothes on, only to cry for self-pity. We know that famous story. And the, I, I felt it's so compelling to see this image as the next two we see here, Nikki, just to share re right here. I, it was so amazing that when you talk about humor and aspect of comic earlier, it's, it's really see, I see it clearly in this painting. So you see here on the left, could be a self-portrait now constitute with being clothed, but mannequin, mannequin like configuration. And if you, the woman on the right there, and then the next image, Nick, can we see it? He put him on the right and her on the left. <laughs> and I just, I, I remember laughing out loud. So, you know, anyone have observation here? Very we much so. <laughs> and I'm just, I know Mark is going to want to uh, add in to here too, but may we go back to the previous slide for just one minute? Um, Fong, I was struck by what you said that you almost laughed and that this was very humorous. And I think that we took a quite different take in our book because um, uh, de Kooning himself uh, once said that there's no way to look at a painting without bringing in the whole history of the, of the painter. Uh, so he introduced the idea of a biography actually into his art, but um, just as a little postscript there. But um, this, the other way to read this is not humor other than the mannequins for which I totally agree but look at this woman's face and so there is a sort of witchy quality to the women in both of these um, uh, paintings and the, also the size if you look at the women here mm -hmm. and then if you look at the next um, painting and we have uh, she whatever she's doing Fong as you said it's very odd kneeling on this this uh, these stones but again she is very prominent. Look at the size of the woman against the man. And, and uh, again, I'm setting this up for Mark, but this was a moment in uh, de Kooning's life where, when his marriage with Elaine was fraying. And, you know, I would submit there is a biographical component in here, it, you know, a very fraught relationship at that moment in his life with the idea of women who were larger than life, like Elaine, who went out into the world and, you know, went to every party and danced on top of pianos, but at home didn't have a lot of time for him. And so there is a, an element of this, it's both biographical more overtly than uh, otherwise in his work, and also this kind of element that's not really funny. But but can Mark speak to this as well for just a minute? I don't know why you're setting me up this way, but <laughs> but uh, but I, I would say that you don't want to reduce it to the personals of his of his life overly. Right. But the fact remains that that they were having their relationship was very troubled at this point, and. Um, he's in a certain kind of mood. I think what's fascinating about it is that he presents himself. He finds it so hard to present himself in any other guise uh, or the male figure, if you don't want to be too personal about it, in any other guise but a kind of stiff mannequin. The woman is not at all like that. She's full of life. And uh, it might be witchy life, but it's full of life. And then there's this strange figure emanating, this ghostly, ghostly creature coming out of the male figure. You know, what is that about? Is that, uh, is that the life leaving him? Is that his actual life? It's a doppelganger of some kind. Uh, it's the a angel peculiar. of the Annunciation. 
Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a certainly a very psychologically fraught image. Both of these images, and even more in the previous one, where you have that sort of uh, figure, right, Richard? There in the middle, you have this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is going on here? Yeah, yeah, and that that figure is very close. I I suspect that this is irrelevant, but that figure is very close to a Cezanne figure. There is a Cezanne bather that has that uh, gesture, but yeah. but it also can be something like a Renaissance angel flying in or a Baroque figure okay. flying in from somewhere or emanating out. Yeah, I mean, is the figure emanating from him or from her? Is the figure gentle about to kiss him on the cheek? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, Could be. You know, it's, it's, and that, that amazing color on in her chest, that sort of, uh, there's a spiky violet dark forms and then that kind of fast green, white and tan thing going on in the center. Well, and the strange little they, tiger suit that, that the male figure is wearing. And the Very yellow nice. of her eyes though, that's what, it, what you can't get over. It looks like a really, you know, terribly uh, scary movie that sort of where, where the, the woman, the, the great villain who is not even human comes out and she has something like those, those horrible cat eyes. Yeah. And, and the teeth. Forget, I yeah. think one shouldn't forget though um, how how savvy de Kooning was about what had been going on around him and not even close to him. This is the figure that is being referred to in the purple area, violet area, is reminiscent of the mannequins that appear in lots of painting in the Neue Sachlichkeit, in the Pintura Metaphysica, and so on. So what it's doing there in de Kooning's context is a question to be examined, but the paradigms are all there by the middle of the 20s, actually. Yeah, John, you have you raise your hand. Yes, well, I'm just um, um, I would like to um, make a plea that we don't think it's obligatory to view this in biographical terms. I mean, okay. it's an option we may choose to take, but I think that um, it shouldn't be urged on people that that that's how they should do it. I mean, we know that these things were made by um, copying and replication. Uh, moving figures around in different spaces, and I'm sure that we can find some um, deep-seated meeting meaning in that, in terms of uh, relative importance in men and women. But um, you know, I just feel that if we go down this road, and um, this yeah. is like you know the wicked witch of Western art, uh, we will yeah. never escape. It's Thank also you, the case that it's also the case that the, that the pattern that was the tiger pattern looks like mm -hmm. a kind of a graphic caricature of a herringbone tweed, and you know mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what was on de Kooning's mind. One can't, but it seems to me that there are jokes in here, or there are abbreviations or solutions, if you want to call it that, that are in here that are entirely visual, but they also have a context, and the context is clones, clothes seen in a store window. Yeah, and, and I. Yeah. Uh, possibly cinematic uh, references also. Say that mm -hmm. again, Richard. Yeah. Possibly cinematic references. Yes. I, I, I mean, they were going to the movies. And, you know. yeah, and, wh and whoever mentions fashion is exactly right. You know, this, this is a fashionable dame. I mean, whatever else she is, <laughs> it's a comment on Kuning's eye. And I, I like to, to, you know, add a little bit here. I just love how the ground is painted, the kind of marble-like texture, you know, black and white and gray. And then when you see the next image, Nick, can you go? It become almost like a pile of oil grease mixed in with the, no, the previous one, the woman painted that one. So I don't know how to describe it, but it looks like it's anticipate for his fully, um, I would say immerse fully in Bowery life, you know, leading to the the the, the famous show, of course, Charles Egan in 1948, the black pic picture. So let's go to the next one quickly, Nick. Valentine, 1947. Um, yes, this is remarkably amazing. But let's go next one just so we can talk about this. One of my favorite paintings of that period, Black Friday. Uh, Charlie, where are you? What do we see here? 1948. Uh, Just one mention. Yeah. Do we have any 
beer really? I mean, I see a lot of letters and some house shapes and things, but I mean, there's really nothing that one could with confidence say, this is a this or that is a that. It's a, it, it, it's, um, it seems to me overwhelmingly uh, ab ab abstract. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you you know that 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 e that every ev every detail is suggestive of of something, but there's no certainty. I mean, it's as if he's um, you know his constant comment ab about it's the not knowing that is the most important thing to me. It it, it seems to me is is uh, quite successfully expressed. In this picture, and 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 the whole group of of uh, these black paintings, um, be, because the, the the mind visually tangles with them. There are these these recognizable clues that look like you you know something familiar that but then a, a, a immediately escape from that uh, familiarity and and that recognition and 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 so when was constantly pausing and, and saying, no, that's not it either. Right. Uh, this is sort of, uh, it, okay, so he was born in April 24. No, yes, that's right, 1904. So this, this show was his first one-man show. Uh, in fact, his 44th birthday took place during the run of the show. Uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. which, remind me immediately because the use, specific use of material. I like to talk a little bit, ask you a little bit about that. Why enamel, you know, paint? Because it's affordable. Okay. He couldn't, that, he couldn't that, go out and buy a lot of colors at that point. So he, he used right. house paint. Right. But never did again, you know, John, that's what is so mysterious to me. He did it in that period and never repeated again. So, how can we see Dot Parnick, which is the next painting? Well, Tom, can I just add, can you go back to Black Friday? Sure. Um, I mean, the other thing, you know, I mean, everybody says it's because it was um, inexpensive. Well, of course, it was inexpensive, but um, using black and white, um, um, you know, some paintings which are principally black with white drawing in, and then the reverse. Um, you know, by using the basic elements of tonal modeling in an exaggerated way um, allows reciprocation of figure and ground and the kind of ambiguities he's interested in to flourish in these paintings. And although it's a lot later that he talks about slipping glimpses, this mm -hmm. is where we start to find them. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, of course, he said is that even abstract shapes have to have a likeness. Yes. And in some cases, he pushes it to likeness, like the um, finger with a fingernail hanging down the middle of the painting, mm -hmm. uh, the rooftops on the top, but others where you can't tell whether they're moving into likeness or not into likeness. And, um, and I think, you know, that these years, you know, 1947 to 49, you know, are just uh, full of amazing pictures where he, making paintings of a relatively small size, is able to, um, you know, just produce and produce extraordinary um, uh, things. And then, of course, as I'm sure we all see in a moment, he explodes this on a large scale, going up to um, excavation. Yeah, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, w how would you would that be also in relation to Pollock using enamel on raw canvas in that context, Robert? Can't say that. I don't know. It's possible. But, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, there were things there were things being done in studios where the word got around it's entirely possible but i think the, the motives for it are economic and also i think the motives graphically or pictorially are the ones that john identifies it's you can reverse the image in very simple terms and you don't have to worry about mixing and blending and doing all the things that he would do with oil paint so economy of means and economy of cost i think are part of sort of the more the more the point yeah Next, can we go to the talk? Pollock is doing. Um, Pollock fine, is can, can I? 
John, um, yes. Can I just jump in and say one thing? Yeah. Um, 553, and we're in 1948. <laughs> okay, you want to move fast, John? No, no, can we have part two? Oh, <laughs> good um, idea. Otherwise, this will be owed to melancholy, not owed to de Kooning. That's true. All right, so why don't we do this? We're going to uh, stop the slides here, and then we could turn to um, Q&A. I think part two sounds great. We're going to do part two. Thank you, John. Because I, I would love to hear um, people talking about the late paintings again, particularly with Rob here. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you, John. That's a great idea. Great idea. It's a very de cooling ass move, John. Very <laughs> swift. Yes. It's Tyson. Yes. Let's turn it back to Nick. Yes. Wait, thank you. Um, we have plenty of questions, um, enough for a part two as well. Uh, but I will first pass the mic over to uh, our friend Phyllis Tuckman. Phyllis, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Well, this was amazing. I usually go to galleries late Saturday afternoon. This was up there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, de Kooning Foundation, for uh, the idea and the sponsorship. Um, when I was asked about a question, I was going to ask about the abstract landscapes of uh, the late 50s. So let me toss this out, Black Friday. By the time we got to Black Friday and its sense of abstraction and no one's really able to say what's going on. Did landscape offer de Kooning better possibilities for becoming an abstract artist? Mm. Brilliant question. Would you like to take that anyone? Uh, I would say that it doesn't matter if it's a still life or a landscape or a figure. It's, it's all painting and it's all, the thing about de Kooning is that he really paints a stream of consciousness. So uh, when he's working on a painting, the relationship is between him and what he's looking at on the canvas and the painting will dictate where he has to go. But when, when we have Black Friday, we now have this amazing moment of Pollock's Horde paintings. And we are talking about somebody who said Jackson broke the ice. Mm -hmm. However, when he said that, he was talking about the market. You know, mm -hmm. we know that when he said that, he was saying that a lot of people from uptown were down buying Pollock's paintings. He was talking about the market. He wasn't talking about the art. He was talking about the market for art. But that said, I think it's also somewhat true. And if Pollock did that with enamels, he got it from the Mexicans and then passed it along to anybody who wanted to pick it up. And de Kooning picked it up, but he obviously was not interested in the same things because de Kooning liked flat, closed surfaces and Pollock liked porous, open ones. So you're dealing with different conventions of painting, not with stylistic similarities or differences or material similarities or differences. There's a, there's a, there's a closed, uh, uh, unyielding aspect to the frontality of de Kooning's paintings mostly that you don't find in Pollock. So de, de, de Kooning tended to work easel size and Pollock liked getting bigger mural size. Um, with regard to things being, you know, the initial question about landscape, I think some of the um, large expansive brush paintings with brushwork, like the late 50s around 1960, they're called landscape as if 
what else are you going to call them? You know, be, I mean, they can't be called figure paintings. So it's that's a marketing issue. Give it a title. Do you I mean don't think merit to be called abstraction? Do you, do you mean like paintings like Merritt Parkway? Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know, rosy fingered dawn and things like that. A little bit later, those uh, Laos Point type paintings with the uh, colors observed, beach colors, atmosphere colors, but um, and al also a, a different kind of brushwork. But so they, uh, you know, a dealer or a critic, whatever, refers to them as landscape for want of a better term. A perfect example, Richard, is Ruth Sowie. Because uh, Ruth Klingman, who you know was seeing the cutting at the time, uh, came in and said Zowie uh, when she saw the painting, and so it became Ruth Zowie. Very, very, you know, very interesting there. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Moving away from the stripper brushes and the contour drawing and so on and so forth to the broad areas of, of, of color and tone, that's the thing that decides it. And bounded rather than unbounded form is what decides it. Now, whether that's landscape or not, it's clearly not what was happening in figuration, where there was a concentration and a bounding of forms. But then again, flash forward to the late paintings, you have where body parts are floating in a kind of soup of other body parts that becomes effectively a landscape. The, the other thing that I want to bring up is that the uh, black and white paintings look very urban. And when he moved out to the Hamptons, he was really going after a certain kind of light. And uh, he carried that on into the very end of his life with those last paintings. And I talked about this down at the Barnes Foundation in terms of the Soutine show, because he was really impressed with the way Soutine could get the light to emanate from the inside outward. But also um, he talked about how he would choose three main colors because we have a trichromatic system of seeing with our cone cells and he would make the flavor of the day. And the other thing about it being not just like the physics of light, but also I took it like, he, it was uh, sort of related to Aristotle's theory of color based on the five elements, but his elements were grass, air, water, uh, sand, and flesh. And he, uh, what, I had a conversation with him in the studio one time when I was a teenager. I said, how do you arrive at your palette? And he said, I ride my bike down to Laos Point. I sit there and I look out at the water and the grass and the sky. And then I go back and I take some tubes and I mix them up into big kitchen bowls. And I have a bowl for each one of those elements. And then all of the tubes that are on the table that went into making those mixtures are all part of it. So it's a vertically integrated palette. And he can use any of those colors straight out of the tube or he can use the mixtures. We can use mixtures when they get on the canvas and it all goes together to make the flavor of the day. And it, so it has that kind of uh, impressionist light. So he could capture the light of the Hamptons, which was completely different from being in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, just for the, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna pass the mic to uh, our next question, which comes from just one moment um, to Richard, sorry. Uh, Richard, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Fong and, and everyone for, and John and everybody for just an incredible, incredible forum. Um, I I have a question. Um, I, in 1983, I, know, I think five different occasions of Picasso's Guernica came to life in that painting. And I was studying with Dori Ashton at the time and I did a thesis on it. And she said, you know, why don't you just go up and ask 
bill. So she gave me his address and I took a little uh, pilgrimage unannounced to his studio and was able to spend the afternoon with him and go through that incredible Howard, uh, Harold Rosenberg book with him. But when we came to Attic and I asked the question, he sort of flipped the page and deferred to excavation um, where he uh, clasped his fingers together of his hands and pulled them tight and said, you know, a painting has to be tight. And we got into this conversation about painting and I never got back to Picasso. So I'm kind of wondering if any of you um, friends and experts and, um, you know, scholars of de Kooning, um, if he ever discussed uh, his digestion and regurgitation of Picasso's Guernica in the painting Attic. He described the painting Attic to me by saying, uh, if I painted everything uh, that you have in the attic. And I said, but Bill, you don't have an attic. And he said, I know, but if I did, this is all the crap I would put into it. <laughs> so uh, he was, it was just, sometimes he would just get an idea, you know, from a phrase or a, an idea, like a concept, like all that stuff up in the attic, you know, or you read John Keats' tombstone, Here Lies John Keats, whose name was written Water, and that triggered the whole series of the paintings in the 70s. And um, it's, 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 it's a way of opening a door and walking into a space where you can look around in the attic and find all these things that are possibilities. Does that, do you agree with me, Richard? Yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, I do. And um, I mean, those two paintings, Attic, Attic and Excavation, they changed a lot in, in the course of their being made because in part, because there was so much to work with, so much space. They're big, especially ex Excavation, bigger than Attic, I think. Thank you both. Um, I think we have time just for one more quick question. Um, I am going to pass the mic to Andrew. Um, Andrew, if you could ask the question that you shared in the chat. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for an amazing conversation. Um, I was just wanting to follow up uh, the paintings before Black Friday. Um, seem like they really have a relationship to drawing. I know excavation in some ways does um, this like erasing or carving into the canvas. And so many of the canvases to me read like they're like the toned paper um, and he's using paint to almost read like charcoal. I was just wondering what he talked about in relationship to drawing with some of these paintings that kind of feel like paint is being used as a gesture to like mimic a drawing practice or if that's relevant at all. Uh, I think drawing and painting are uh, completely integrated in his paintings. In the very late paintings, um, he actually drew by extruding uh, a line out of a small tube of oil paint and making one like paint, like cake decorating. He would just, so he'd have one continuous line and then he would follow it up with a big wide spatula and scoop it off so it would be smooth again. So, uh, you know, the way that he controlled the edges of shapes, paint, he had complete control over uh, the brush because he was a trained sign painter. And he would then do it with four inch brush, house painters brushes too, but he could, he could really sculpt an edge and you'd have it from, you know, the outside, then it would continue on the inside and it would swap figure and ground. And he continued doing that. Uh, well, he started doing it back when he first met Gorky and continued on to the very final paintings. Um, anyone else want to add to what Jones say there at all? I mean, for my uh, own, I think observation, it seemed to me the 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 working from Asheville to Attic and then to excavation 
uh, is a testament of all the things that you were saying, asking between drawing and painting together. And it's forever packed. I mean, that's we have to wait for the next part two, as John suggested, because we can spend easily an hour talking on excavation, which make David Reed very happy. Because <laughs> you know, <laughs> talk about that painting forever with Richard, different time with John and others. Um, so maybe maybe that's a good place to end, really, for now, part two, because it is now 6.10, and I know it's Saturday, so we do have to have a drink, except for Robert. One last remark. Yes, Robert. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excavation has come up repeatedly in the last 10, 15 minutes. It's worth noting that that painting is in the Art Institute of Chicago and all the students in the Art Institute of Chicago had to pass it to get to their classes and not the least of them by far was Elizabeth Murray. So the spark jumped from de Kooning to an entirely different generation in Elizabeth for whom drawing and painting were also totally commingled. Terrific. Thank you, Robert. Back to you, Nick. I, yes, there, there are so many more works to be discussed, so many more questions to be asked. Um, so we will absolutely pick this back up in a part two. But as said, uh, our tradition here is to end all of our community events with a poetry reading. And I'm honored today to welcome our poet laureate, Erica Hunt, to the stage. Poet and scholar Erica Hunt is the author of numerous publications, including Veronica, A Suite in Ten Parts from Selva Oscura Press in 2019, and Jump the Clock from Nightboat Books in 2020, a collection spanning from the 1980s to the present. With Dawn Lundy Martin, she is the co-editor of Letters to the Future, Radical Writing by Black Women from Corey Press. Um, Hunt has received awards from the Foundation for Contemporary Art, the Fund for Poetry, and the Jurassi Foundation, and is a past fellow of Duke University, the University of Cape Town Program in Public Policy. Uh, without further ado, Erica, the stage is yours. Hey, good afternoon. Um, what a fascinating afternoon. Um, so much that I have learned about de Kooning. I've been an admirer, of course, of the painting, but um, what a wonderful uh, uh, experience to hear people who have both known him and studied the work. Um, it also it illuminates a poem that I want to share. I really don't, you know, I don't need to read my poem so much as I want to read this poem, which is indeed titled Ode to Willem de Kooning, written by Frank O'Hara, someone who loved de Kooning, loved him. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I think de Kooning uh, returned that affection and regard um, and when O'Hara met an early and untimely death in a car accident, de Kooning went to his bedside and saw him as, you know, was one of the last people that O'Hara saw. O'Hara is a New York school poet, for those of you who might not be um, familiar with him, and I just thought I would read this poem and end our afternoon together. Ode to Willem de Kooning. So much, by the way, if, of this conversation shows up in this poem in various ways. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, really timely apt. Beyond the sunrise where the black begins, an enormous city is sending up shutters. And just before the last lapse of nerve, which I'm already sorry for, the friends describe as just this once in a temporary hell, I hope to, I try to seize upon greatness, which is available to me through generosity and lavishness of spirit, yours not to be inimitably weak and picturesque, myself, but to be standing alone, clearly alone in the orange wind while our days tumbled and ran through Gotham and the Easter Narrows to de Kooning paintings, by the way. And I have not the courage to convict myself of cowardice or care. For now, a long history slinks over the sill or patent absurdities and the fathomless miseries of a small person upset by personality. And I look to the flags in your eyes as they go up on the enormous walls 
as the brave must always ascend into the air, always the must like banderillas dangling and jingling jewel-like amidst the red drops on the shoulders of men who lead us not forward or backward, but on as we must go on out into the mesmerized world of inanimate voices like traffic noises hewing and a clearing in the crowded abysses of the West. Two, stars of all passing sights, language, thought, and reality. I am assuming that one knows what it is to be ashamed and that the light we seek is broad and pure, not winking, and that the evil inside us now and then strolls into a field and sits down like a forgotten rock while we walk on to a horizon line that's beautifully keen, precarious, and doesn't sag beneath our variable weight. In this dawn, as in the first, it's the Homeric rose, its scent that leads us up the rocky path into the past where death can disappear or where the face of future senses may appear in a white night that opens after the embattled hours of the day. And the wind tears up the rose, fountains of prehistoric light falling upon the blinded heroes who did not see enough or were not mad enough or felt too little when the blood began to pour down the rocky slopes into pink seas. Three, dawn must always recur to blot out stars and the terrible systems of belief. Dawn which dries out the web so the wind can blow it, spider and all away, dawn erasing blindness from an eye inflamed, reaching for its morning cigarette in Promethean inflection after the blames and desperate conclusions of the dark where messages were intercepted by an ignorant horde of thoughts and all simplicities perished in desire. A bus crashes into a milk truck and the girl goes skating up the avenue with streaming hair roaring through fluttering newspapers and their Athenian contradictions. For democracy is joined with stunning collapsible savages, all natural and relaxed and free. As the day zooms into space and only darkness lights our lives with few flags flaming, imperishable courage and the gentle will, which is the individual dawn of genius rising from its bed. Maybe they're wounds, but maybe they are rubies, each painful as a sun. So uh, just to say a couple words about this, you, the early on uh, uh, the poem references two paintings by de Kooning, Gotham News, Easter Monday, which were painted in 1955 and 1956. The poems uh, composed of paratactic sentences. It keeps starting over and over again. It never quite, right? It just keeps going forward. It's a poem of phrases. And the phrases, in oh, it reminds me of a writing exercise where you're supposed to write and write and write and never lift your pen from the page. And if you lift your pen from the page, then you have to begin again. And I wonder to what extent this is a kind of, uh, of a, a kind of brushing, a kind of stroke. You know, a paint, the paintbrush on the canvas, the pen on the piece of paper. So um, it was a pleasure to spend the afternoon with you. I don't want to uh, keep us much longer um, and to think about de Kooning and this wonderful friendship that he had that, that existed between de Kooning and O'Hara, Frank O'Hara. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so sincerely, Erica, um, for such a perfect way to end today's conversation. Um, I, I also want to thank, of course, John, Joan, David, Richard, Mark, Robert, Charles, Annalyn, Flora, and Fong for our conversation today. A very special thank you to Amy, Madeline, and everyone at the Willem de Kooning Foundation for their support and for making this possible. 
we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation as soon as early next week. And we're here every day, not usually on Saturdays, but uh, we're here every day, Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So join us on Monday if you can for a conversation with artist Mel Bachner and rail art scene editor Amanda Gouy-Bitsy. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Mark Leitner. And uh, you now can all turn on your microphones to say hello and uh, goodbye as we go. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Don. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Good idea, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, John. Beautiful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Flora. Thank you, Charles. Where are you, Charlie? All right. Going off to have a drink with <laughs> me. Okay, that's a good idea. We're going to celebrate you, our video visit. Yeah. Thank you, Fran. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank, you John. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Let's go have a drink. Thank you, Flora, for tuning in from London. Yes. Thank you, Thank you yes. It's Thank quite you. late where you are, Flora. Thank you for staying up so late with us. Yes. Pleasure. James. Yes, James G. And in Vermont, Vaughn. Thank yeah. you. Vermont. Tune in from Vermont. That's great. Hello. Well, let's much love. Let's go have a drink. Hey, Kyle. Hi, Janet. <laughs> hey. Okay. Thank you Long all for joining. Live to Kooning. Long live to Kooning. <laughs> Stay safe and well, everyone. Long live to Cooning. Ciao. Much love. Ciao. Ciao.